It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Marta Hatch, who will uh, speak uh, to all of you. Uh, professor Marta is, uh, is professor at the Department of Political Science here at the University of Sao Paulo, director of the Center for Metropolitan Studies, and editor of the Brazilian Political Science Review. Uh, she has been since he, she has been, until two months ago, or a month ago, vice provost of research at this university. Uh, she got her, her PhD degree from the University of Campinas and has been visiting researcher of the Department of Political Science uh, at MIT in 2000-2001 and at the Department of Political and Social Science, Science at the Euro European University Institute. Uh, Professor Marta is a specialist in a lot of things, but uh, their, uh, her works uh, are basically, basically on the area of federalism, uh, public policies, uh, and inequality. Uh, she has uh, published um, three, I think, more than that, but three very important books. One is Democracia, Federalismo e Centralização no Brasil, Democracy, Federalism and Centralization in Brazil. The other is the Federal State and uh, Social Policies. And finally, Trajectories of Inequalities, which has been a huge research project uh, which she coordinate and about which she's going to talk uh, some, something uh, for us now. So, Marta, thank you very much. I'm very happy to have you here. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Maria Arminia, for having thought of my name to present the results of a research I uh, conducted at the Center for Metropolitan Studies. The presentation I will make will be about part of the findings we had uh, in this project. Uh, the book uh, in Portuguese will publish it in 2015, and then for the publication in English, which is gonna uh, come out uh, later this year, uh, we have updated some information and, of course, some uh, reflections. So that's what I will talk about uh, uh, this afternoon. My presentation fits very well the, uh, the general conclu uh, conclusions uh, Otaviano presented this morning, but uh, I will talk uh, only about uh, Brazil and uh, the talk about a period which goes from, which is our de most recent uh, democratic period. So it's a discussion about uh, how democracy can affect or not the path uh, of uh, inequality. There are two different stories about the path of inequality in Brazil under democracy. One says that income inequality in Brazil remained remain stable. So because the richest, particularly the 1% uh, richest, get an exceptionally large share of total income. So according to the data, uh, around 25% of total income, including wealth, is, 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 is captured, as captured, is, is gained by the richest in Brazil. So according to this story, neither democracy nor, nor left-wing governments, I mean Lula's and Dilma's uh, governments, affected income inequality. A second story says the opposite. It says that income inequality declined in Brazil from the early 90s on. And it not only declined, but it sharply declined 
particularly under the worker parties government, workers party uh, governments. Some, some authors go beyond this statement and said that under this period, the weight of income inequality in Brazil was fasted, was uh, stronger, larger than Sweden at, this, at a similar period. In other words, this story says that both democracy and left-wing governments affect the income inequality in Brazil. So you, you, can, you can observe that we have two different conclusions. And as odd as it might sound, both are correct. Both because each uh, analysis, each story, is based upon different concepts of inequality and different metrics of inequal income inequality. The first story is demonstrated, and very well demonstrated, by Piketty's followers. And, uh, and so they, they um, look at their concept of in the concept of income inequality they are working with is a concept which says that we observe income inequality by measuring how much the richest have from the total cake, right? So this story uh, conflates the concept of income inequality with the concept of wealth concentration. So if, if wealth is concentrated, then we have income inequality. And income inequality declines if and only if wealth is deconcentrated. This deconcentration, deconcentrated. That is, if the richest get a smaller part of the pie. The second story is looking at the remaining 99%. And so the second story looks at what happened with the other, with the, with the income of those that, that, that are not the richest. And so this story, uh, as Otaviano uh, told us this morning, is based upon surveys. It is based upon self-declaration of people. The, the Piketty's methodology is based upon uh, tax records. In, in the Brazilian case, it means that we have no means of knowing what happened with 85% of the population, for the simple reason that in Brazil, around 80% of the population does not earn enough money even to be obliged to declare this, this, their earnings to the tax authorities. So that's why those that are interested in looking at what happened with the 90% less richest, must look at survey data. Although we know that when looking at survey data, we, we miss the richest. But we have no solution, because if we look at tax records, we miss the poorest, right? So, but the point is, the theoretical point we are in, the, 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 the finding, important finding here is, is, is it that in Brazil, the wealth remained as highly concentration. It's Brazil as we ever know, knew it. And at the same time, under democracy, there has been an important reduction in inequality. I'm interested in the second story. 
I do not deny the first one. It is very, very important. But the methods, the concepts we have to use to, to look at either interpretation are different. And I'm interested in the second story, and it is the second story I'll talk, I'll talk about uh, uh, to you uh, uh, this afternoon. And why is it the second story so important? Because, first of all, because it's true. Second, because it allows us to understand some of the conflicts democracy has underwent in Brazil. Okay, so uh, the first point is that I do not deny the first story, story one, but this is I will I will not we will not talk it about anymore this afternoon. I will talk, I will try to convince you that the second story is very, very important to understand the kind of challenges a highly unequal country can face under democracy. Let me show you uh, some data about the relative income gains each strata of the population uh, gains ha has earned from 1984, the last year uh, before uh, the democratic period in Brazil, and 2015. So this is the method uh, for measuring relative income, income gains uh, here is the same that Otaviano adopted to describe Milanovic's uh, conclusion. You, we ta you take the gains of each household at the first year of interest, and then we, you measure the relative gains each strata of the population has had throughout a period. So what is this graph saying? The, the, the Brazilian households are divided uh, in 20 pieces, ordered from the poorest to the richest. I, I, it's true that the richest are not very well measured here because, as I told you, the, it's only tax records that allow us to better measure the earnings of the richer. But it's not in the richest. But this is not important for the, the argument I will try to, to defend uh, today. So the, 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 the lowest column uh, uh, displays the relative gains of the 5% poorest in Brazil. The second, the, 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 the second ventile, the third, the, the third ventile, and so on. So what this graph is, is showing is that the poorest had had more relative income gains than the richest in Brazil in this, uh, this last, uh, under democracy. Uh, the most influential theory in political science about the effect of democracy uh, supports this, this outcome. It says that it's, it's a theory we call the median voter th uh, theory. It argues that under democracy, if each citizen, each voter, has the same, uh, each, uh, has the same weight on the decision, and the, this, in the poorest are the majority, the, the poorers will, will vote in favor of redistribution. And so? Redistribution is the expected outcome under democracy. So if you look at the 11th ventile, you, you'll see that the, uh, the, uh, the, those that form the majority of the poorers had gained more, right? Uh, But this is this relative gains. So if you earn as the poorest had 
106% over 90 euros, which was the case in, the, in 1984, in absolute terms, it is much less than gaining around 10% over 1 million, right? This is relative income. This is wh why the concentration of wealth does not change too much. But again, that's not the point. It is just to understand this graph. Now look at this data. This is the same data, but it refers to each president we have. We can read the same way. The poorest are below, and the highest uh, you are on the distribution, the, the, the richer the, the population represented by each one tile is. So, as you can see, the, the, the first, the first uh, figures uh, on the upper left refers to Governo Sarney. It shows that Governo Sarney was the most regressive government we had under democracy. The poorest earn less and the richest earn more. The, the second, the upper, uh, in the upper side, in the middle, shows colors government. Under colors government, everybody loses, but the richest lose more. It might have been the expropriation of the savings, which was the most important measure of his government. Look at, uh, but observe that uh, even in, uh, well, let, uh, let me fall, I'll come back to this point later on. The, the, the upper right figure is government Fernando Henrique. You will see that the riches lose a little and the poorest earn a bit more. In the uh, left, down, left, uh, I'm confused now, left down, uh, left bottom, left bottom figure uh, is Lula's government. Uh, so, what this, this figure is showing is that under Lula's government, every household earn, but in the poorest, earn much more. In my opinion, that's what explains the uh, approval of Lula for the next uh, election. Uh, and it also, in my opinion, expresses the approval of Lula, the, 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 what the poor rates say about Lula, expresses an expectation of a continuation of the process of inclusion we have had in, uh, in this period. And the, the, the last figure is Dilma's government. Uh, I didn't split it, but if I had split her first term in the two first years of her, her term, it would be different because the, the, the last two years she was in government, earnings were negative due to the economic crisis, right? But the point is here is that um, if we look at the relative income gains adopting Milanovic's method, uh, democracy and left-wing governments indeed uh, made a difference in, in people's uh, uh, income uh, in Brazil. And as the poorest uh, earn more than the richest, we can say, according to a matrix that's, that states that whenever the poorest gain more than the richest, there has been uh, uh, redistribution of income. But this is very preliminary, I'll go ahead. But the, so the first point is that uh, uh, there has been, if you look at the, the, what happened with 99% of the population, 
uh, a process of uh, uh, gain, income gains that the poorest benefited more. But let me come back to the, uh, let me, and um, there are several uh, reasons why there has been uh, uh, a reduction in income inequality in Brazil. Otaviano mentioned two very important mechanisms this morning. Bolsa Familia, which reached the poorest, and important transformations in the job market in Brazil. So, uh, uh, econometrics say, says that about two thirds of that what happened in Brazil in this period was was a byproduct of uh, the job market. But one important uh, uh, mechanism through which income inequality was reduced was reduced was the value of the minimum wage. Just to say you an important political data, 25% of Brazilian voters have their earnings earmarked to the minimum wage. This is very, very important to understand political decisions about the minimum wage. Professor Limonge used to say that the social policy in Brazil used to be the value of the minimum wage. And this is very, very true. But this in, in, if you have this information in mind, we understand the political mechanisms behind this sharp increase. So uh, the second term of Fer Fernando Henrique's term initiated this increase, but under Lula it increased a lot. But let me go back to that data. The value of the minimum wage is usually uh, discussed in Brazil in terms of its impact on the fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, health of, uh, of the Brazilian budget. This is true, and this is a very important impact. But there is another Im impact people uh, hardly talk about, which is the impact of the minimum wage on families' budget. What I mean by that? Imagine you are um, uh, a worker which is in the middle of the distribution, so you, you are around the 10th or the 19th ninth ventile, and you have no place to leave your children the entire day. Or you have nobody to clean your house. So, because there are no public services in Brazil. So, you, are, you need a very badly paid woman working in your house. So you, it, you, you are not middle class in the sociological sense, but you are in the middle of the distribution. You are not rich. You struggle every day to raise your children, pay your bills, and so on. So if the value of the minimum wage increases, you cannot afford to pay that. In other words, Brazil has always been such an unequal country that the well-being of those that are in the middle of the distribution is made at the costs of very badly low-skilled low -skill, uh, full people providing services. So, it means that reducing income inequality, or in other words, increasing the payments of low-skilled workers, which use it to be very ill-paid in Brazil, is not affordable for most families that, that need these services because they cannot count upon um, 
public services that are crucial for their lives. In my understanding, this is one of the main political conflicts in Brazil. The conflict is not mainly between the very rich, the elite, but it's between those that are very low skilled, very badly paid, and whose earnings are paid by those that are a bit better than them, but are not rich at all. And so, I, my understanding is that all the conflicts around Lula's figure expresses somehow this conflict. First of all, those that favor him remind their lives were better when he was in power. But the same intermediary people in the scale distribution remind that it was unaffordable to pay the commitments PT's governments were making people make to. Uh, and so Brazil is a case of a highly unequal country that, are, that was successful to, to make a transition to democracy, but it's possible that reducing inequality poses a conflict, not between the very poor and the elite, but between the very poor and those that are a bit better than them, but cannot afford paying them better wages. Uh, that's my first point. My second point refers to the, to the limits we can, we can have in examining uh, inequality reduction and focused only on income. There is no theoretical reason to think on inequality only in terms of income. Indeed, the comparative analysis of inequality is based upon income for pragmatical reasons. It's easier to find comparable data, or more or less comparable data. What Aviano told this morning that Piketty get together the data he could. It's not very, very cl clear that even data on income is, co is perfect comparable between countries. But, but those that make research know that we do the best to uh, obtain inferences from limited data. But uh, my point here is that there is no theoretical re reason to think uh, on inequality only in terms of income. We do that for practical reasons. In fact, services directly affect people's earnings. Two citizens having the same earnings, the same wage, have completely different li lives if one can rely upon health and free, uh, free and public education and health, and the other has to pay for. So when we are comparing income without taking it into account crucial needs, crucial services, we are making a rough comparison. In, indeed, we need to know how can people get at least health and education. Otherwise, earnings are not comparable. So there are good theoretical reasons to look at, at other dimensions. So let me, let me show you what happened uh, in Brazil for the period we have good data about. It's 1998 and 2000, 2013. All, all um, uh, researchers show that Having a private health insurance is by fear, 
the most important uh, factor in uh, in explaining an equal access to health. This happens in the entire world, except for Scandinavian countries. Uh, yeah, but in Brazil, this is the case. And what is this graph show? The, the, the left, uh, the left uh, graph. The access to uh, to private insurance, health privacy insurance, is my, uh, once more uh, separated according to people's earnings. So the upper line. Uh, displays the uh, the share of households in the fifth quantile, so the richest, having health private insurance in this period. So it is saying that around 60% of the 20% uh, richest have um, uh, health private insurance. Remind that in Brazil, uh, being in, at the 20% uh, richest is not that richest. This is the border of not even being obliged to to declare your earnings. Okay, so it, this this uh, uh, quantile it, uh, is this average might surely has a high standard deviation. But look at the uh, continuous line at the bottom. It displays the share of the 20% the poorest uh, that have health private, health, health private insurance. They do not have, right? So it's highly unequal in Brazil, and it remains this way the access to health private insurance, which is by far, I repeat, the most impact, important factor affecting uh, health uh, inequality. The right um, uh, figure shows the how, uh, uh, again, by each quantile, the, 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 the percentage of people who said that they have looked for uh, health care and had gotten it in the last two weeks. You can again observe that there is a difference. The poorest had less, have less and the richest have more. But to look at the distance in 1998 between the poorest and the richest. And look at the distance in 2013. This is not the country we'd like to, according to, to egalitarian feelings, this is not the country we would like to live in. But my point is that inequality has been reduced because the distance between the richest and the poorest has shortened. And what explains that? Look now at these people that had answered, they had access to healthcare in the last uh, two weeks when they were asked. Look that now the, the, the continuous line is the highest and the richest are on the bottom. What does it mean? It means that that decline in inequality reduction in access to health is explained by SUS. In, for those that are not Brazilian, by a public health care free system, which is at stake now for funding reasons. But what is the, this figure is demonstrated is that under democracy, Brazil has built a health care system that reduces inequality in access to health care. The right figure refers to access to dentists. Again, look how the line of the poorest increase sharply, and the distance between the richest and the poorest is reduced. 
So again, the point is not there is not inequality has not been eliminated. The point that is that inequality has reduced, and it was, has reduced. It has been reduced due to a public health care system. And of course, those that have access to health care through SUS, through the public system, do not spend money with health care, and so their real incomes are higher than those that do not have. So a public health care system makes a lot of difference both in terms of health inequality and in terms of people's income real income. Let's look at the gap between color gap. So how could, do we calculate that? We, again, split the population into five equal pieces and calculate the earnings of the black, the, the, the non-black, oh, sorry. Uh, we calculate the earnings of the non-white over the uh, earnings of the white. So, and we have uh, three, four years here, 1987 and 1990, which are the two uh, lines uh, above. And uh, two two thousand one, which is in the middle, the the um, you know, because it is a dotted line below as well. In the two thousand twelve and two thousand fifteen, which are those lines below? What is this this graph showing? In nineteen eighty seven and nineteen ninety, the color earnings gap ratio in Brazil was higher than in the end of the period. There are two patterns here. One is a higher ratio in the beginning of democracy and the lower ratio in the end of the period. Look at the poorest, which is the beginning of the X line, X, uh, X, uh, X axis. This is a wild word, right? Because earnings are much higher. Look at the point at, at the sixth and seventh C, seventh ventile. <coughs> the ratio is one. What does it mean? What it means that around the sixth and seventh ventile, there is no difference between black and uh, non-white non and white people in terms of earnings. This population are those that earn the minimum wage. And after that, the higher you, ha the higher you are in the income distribution, the higher is the difference. So this, this, this figure shows shows, uh, just, uh, let's say, it offers information for any conclusion you might want to obtain. If you, if you want to say inequality did not change in Brazil, okay, it did not change. Because the higher you are, the higher is the uh, color earning gap between non-white and white. But if you want to say that inequality has reduced, you also have data to, show, to say that because the pattern is lower than it used to be. So this is the problem for anyone uh, studying inequality. You can, you can obtain different conclusions. What's the best conclusion? That, that they, takes into account all important evidence. That's the not biased one. The, look at the same data for gender earning gap. Again, it used to be a, a wild word 
in the beginning of democracy. Look at the, at the, the, the highest values for the poorest in the years 1981 and 1990. Low-skilled women use a term Low skilled men use it to earn three times what a woman earned. And it, this is what happened with the people earning around one minimum wage. When we look at the micro data, in 99, from 1992 on, people earning one minimum wage started to increase in number, and most of them are women. Women were integrated through the minimum uh, wage uh, policy. But look, there, there is the same pattern you observe for the color earnings ratio gap. Because inequality declined, but difference between men and women in, the, in terms of their earnings do not diverge if we go further on the higher, uh, higher earnings. So we can say that in spite of a lot of inclusion, it, it, that's the point I'm trying to, to defend here, we can say that the, the blacks and the non-whites were the least benefited by the process of inclusion we have had in Brazil. Oh, sorry. Look at the same data for access to electricity. So the, high, the, 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 the upper line refers to the richest, and the lower line refers to the poorest. The first year is 1981. You can say that access to ele electricity was not a problem at all for the rich in the beginning of democracy. Look at the distance in access between the poorest and the richest. And look at the behavior of this line. So it changed a lot. And there, has, there's, there have some studies showing that it changed a lot, not only people's lives, but their cities life because electricity is not a matter of household access, it's a collective good. So it affects an entire city, an entire neighborhood. The same behavior uh, we can observe for, for sewage, but a much lower uh, uh, level. For the simple reason that, that providing sewage collection is much more expensive than providing electricity. In electricity, when you have energy power, it's just a matter of extending the lines. Whereas sewage uh, implies infrastructure buildings. But anyway, look at the, uh, the, the, the line that increased more refers to the poorest. So my point is, uh, that if we look at all these di di different dimensions, including income and including other key dimensions of people's life, there has been a lot of inclusion in Brazil uh, in the last uh, 30 years. The point is, is it due to democracy? Or is it due to industrialization? Is it due to another factors? Did democracy affect this behavior somehow? So what's, what's uh, my, my interpretation based on the, on the, on the uh, research we made? It's true that um, economic growth, globalization, Demo demographic change, all these factors affect and indeed affect the path of inequality. But in Brazil, we had, up to 1988, uh, a, a model of social policy that produced a big divide 
between citizens. Because our model, which was created in 1930, actually 1933, divided workers and citizens between two types. Those that are formal position in the job market, and by having a former position in the job market, they were entitled to health to healthcare, and they were also entitled to uh, social security. And so they have two key dimensions of people's lives protected. They have jobs uh, protection, they have access to health care, and they have access to pensions and retirement. The problem is that these people, these insiders, were around 40% of the population, which means that 60% were outsiders. Uh, so the point here is that apart from the earnings differences, social policies, the, the way social policies operated produced a big divide between insiders and outsiders. And outsiders were, in fact, the majority. So Brazil was, apart from those data on income inequality, a highly unequal society. And in spite of that, we had a peaceful, although long, transi transition to democracy. Some uh, political scientists, like uh, Charles Boax, which is a very uh, influent political science, says this is unfeasible that the rich would not support transition to democracy if they fear that the operation of the median voter mechanisms, mechanism meaning that the poorer being the majority of voters will extract earnings from the rich. So he says, the rich say that, know that, and so they will not support transition to democracy. And he says, an equal society have a low possibility of, of moving from the autocratic uh, regimes to democratic ones. The point is, Brazil is a case of a highly unequal society that made a successful transition to democracy, and more than that, an inclusive one for the reasons I have I had I, I, I just shown you. So uh, but we, we, we were able to, to change uh, the limited uh, way we changed, but, but still much better than we used to be. We were able to change through a process uh, that can be deployed in two steps. One is the outcome of the, the democratization process, whose, whose most important byproduct is the 1988 Constitution. Because the const it, is the, it was the Constitution that stated that non-contributory pensions would be earmarked to the minimum wage. That was enlarged the number of people earning the minimum wage by according to the law. And so the, the, the pensioners that started, the, the amount of pensioners earning the minimum uh, wage uh, aff affect somehow the functioning of uh, the job market. And so these people uh, be turned out to be around 25% of voters, 
And so they are very, very important in, in, in uh, any elections. But I'll come back to this point later on. I'm, I'm uh, now trying to demonstrate to you that the first step was the 1988 Constitution, which constitutionalized some important uh, 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 provisions. The second one is the introduction of a free, public, and universal uh, system of health and education. I didn't talk uh, about education to, 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 to make it uh, not, to, not to be too long, uh, but I, uh, if you are interested, in, I can show you some data uh, uh, afterwards. But the point here is that the left-wing uh, parliamentaries were a minority in the 1988 Constitution. It's not this change in the Constitution is not explained by the power of the left. It was not the left that drafted uh, this provision, and it was not the left that approved them. The majority were conservatives, which were worried about social unrest. There was, at that point, let's stress that at that point, a common, a shared, vision that even among the conservatives that democracy would not be sustainable if poverty were not reduced. My, my point of view is that that shared understanding does not exist anymore. But at that point, this was important for approving the Constitution. And, the, and then there are some institutional mechanisms as well uh, through which progressive uh, uh, parliamentaries took advantage of key positions in the constitution draft that made uh, a difference. But the point is that the outcome of democratization process was a constitution uh, which an inclusive constitution. A, a, a constitution which entitled the poorest to have pensions, to have access to health care, to have health, uh, access to uh, education, and so on. Once that constitution, constitution was approved, a new mechanism and a different one took place. The, the, these policies approved in the Constitution, these provisions approved uh, in the Constitutions, turned out to be the mechanism through which social policies, social po politics on social policies uh, operated. So first of all, there has been a, a, an, a, an increase on the voters whose life depended on these policies. So, the entire population is dependent of the public health care. And so voting against SUS or voting against uh, uh, public health has a political cost for, for, for parliamentaries. The same for the minimum wage. Those that live in Brazil know that every at the end of the year, when the, when the fiscal budget is framed, everybody looks at the value of the minimum wage to, to calculate what uh, the benefits is coming. So in, in political terms, it means that any voter is looking at, the, uh, at this decision, and this has a price. Uh, this is a very, very important decision for, uh, for parliamentary survivors as well. So my, my uh, interpretation is that this mechanism produces a kind of con convergence between center-right and left-wing parties around the preferences of the poorer. So the problem of the right-wing parties in Brazil is not the poorer, but they unionize it. And the public officials, they vote for increasing the minimum wage, they vote for health care, they vote for education. And 
because in, in, in the right-wing parties need this constituency because they cannot rely up only upon the, the, the richest to win an election. And left-wing parties cannot rely only upon unionized and public officials. They, they must look for the poor as well. So there has been, in the last 30 years, a convergence between center-winger parties and left-winger parties, center, center, right. Uh, my brain is <laughs> almost falling apart. <laughs> Center-right parties and left-wing parties. Uh, and this, uh, and add to that that after running four ele elections, the left-wing party became competitive. By being competitive, I mean that it risked to win an election. So this kind of electoral competition around social policies, what is the political mechanism behind this incremental uh, inclusion? And do not forget that in Brazil, uh, levels of uh, uh, turnout are, are higher, are very high, even as compared to other democracies. It means that the poor vote. And so all parties, look for poorer preferences when they, they, they calculate their vote in the parliament. So, uh, my point is that uh, uh, up to 2015, which is where a new story we don't understand very well yet started, this mechanism explains the inclusion. The point is that, the first point I think we should think about is that I'm, I'm, I'm entirely sure there has been a lot of inclusion. I'm, I'm less sure about redistribution. Because redistribution means that the rich get less and the poor get more. We know that the poor have gotten more, but the tax system in Brazil does not allow us to say that the richer are paying more. So it's not clear yet. Uh, evidence does not support there has been redistribution, although there has been uh, inclusion. But I think that we have a broader perspective if you look beyond income. There is no theoretical look to look, uh, reason to look only for, for income. And if, you look, if you look at another dimensions which are key to understand people's life, we can see that there has been a lot of uh, inclusion. So I would be in favor of a more comprehensive theory of uh, inclusion uh, when we look at for uh, inequality. But uh, we we uh, we I think are better served to interpret what is the kind of challenges a highly unequal society faces when observing uh, inclusion, redistribution, inequality reduction. If we uh, avoid what I think is the trap of the median voter theory. The median voter theory assumes that all those that are in the lowest health share the same preferences and the same needs. This is not true. It was not true when we, we approved the 1908 Constitution and I think it's less true now. I think that the redistributive conflicts between the poorest and those that, were, that are a bit better than them is, is something we should underst understand better. The conflict Brazilian and whence now is less between the poorest and the richest and more between what we 
loosely calls as middle class, which in fact is composed by those that are not very, very poor, that are low skilled, but their, every er their average earnings are around five minimum wages or so. Uh, and uh, we are not, at least in the Brazilian case, we are not very well served if you think only in terms of left versus right wing parties. Uh, all these changes I've talked to you about were based on decisions made by arenas where the left was a minority. Their approval required the support of the center, to say the least. So um, uh, we we uh, needed to further explore the Brazilian case, which I think can be useful to understand the conflicts. Uh, democratic and highly unequal societies uh, face. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta, for this very interesting and encompassing uh, lecture. Uh, let's collect some questions and then uh, get back to, uh -huh. to Marta to, to answer. I ask you, when you ask questions, please uh, say your name and institutional affiliation. <laughs> Marta, it was very, very interesting to, to hear your presentation because you have this kind of panorama of the, the process, so I, I would like to see your data better later. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I was all the time uh, thinking about other possible explanations for the facts you are showing. So I have three questions, actually. I'll read here because I have took my notes. Let me see. So the, the first one is about the, the public service. You, you put a, a, a strong um, emphasis uh, on that. But I, I was wondering, in case the development, the economic development uh, con had continued, if you had the same problem, because the, the upper stratus would have gained it as well, so you could have people, uh, I mean, not so pressured by the issues you, you mentioned. And uh, I also think that there are other issues that appear in the process that are more concerned with uh, symbolic uh, stratification, you know. During this process, you, as as you show, uh, the blacks, the women, I would say, uh, the uh, the gays and other minorities or so-called minorities came to be more included because of the constitution itself and because of the redistribution. Oh, the redistribution is not a good word anymore. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I think this, this uh, um, symbolic differences among the groups decreased together with the difference in, in, in income or access. So I'd like to hear what you think about, because I think that's very important to explain conflicts among those, those groups. And the other, the other question is about the, the access to information that, as you show, uh, people came to be more included in terms of public services, but some of them are in uh, TV, uh, cell phones, internet. So all of those things grew in the period as well. So people had access to more information about the good and bad information about uh, how things uh, work, so how that would impact their their uh, behavior. And if I'm not, um, uh, if I, I, I did not understand you uh, wrongly, you said mainly that social policy is the core of the process here, 
And so I was wondering uh, if you can talk about similar process not related to democracy, for instance, during the Vargas government. So you have more access to this kind of rights, but you are not followed by a democratization in the other, in the political field. Could you please uh, repeat the first question, please? The, uh, I, I did not understand it. I can. Uh, uh, I have the same question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, you. When you talk about the conflict between the very poor and not so very poor people around the value or the level of minimum wage, you are supposing this is a zero-sum conflict. Mm -hmm. And you have a zero-sum conflict when you don't have growth. Because if you have growth, both grow and, and that, okay? May I ask the first? Uh, actually, okay. my question is also related okay. to these uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, the first question is a more conceptual question, but it's directly uh, related to the questions uh, posed by Maria Hermina and also Angela, is about the definition of inequalities. Because uh, you bring a very interesting point that is a political analysis of social structure, which is not very common. Normally, you have economists and sociologists studying social structure, and you have political scientists studying politics. And you combine both is very, very uh, inspiring and useful. But there I have a question, because uh, in our consequences, you take inequalities only in terms of material inequalities. What mm -hmm. about power inequalities? I think to understand uh, the legacy of democracy for inequalities in Brazil, and especially the legacy of uh, left-wing governments for inequalities, we have also to take this dimension separately power inequalities, which sometimes can also be translated into material gains, but not always. Sometimes you can have uh, power gains. I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I have not to explain you to, uh, as, but to you <laughs> as a political scientist, just to explain the question. So perhaps for your scheme could be interesting to separate this both dimension of inequalities explicitly, saying I am analyzing here um, the socioeconomic dimension of inequalities and the political dimension or the power inequalities. And then you have other actors, not only individuals, as in case of Gini coefficient and so on, but you have also groups, mm -hmm. GLBT or uh, mm -hmm. women, as, as you do, but you analyze this in terms of socioeconomic inequalities. And the second question is quite uh, brief, is just because even if, if you don't, uh, um, if you don't say you are um, somehow providing a class analysis, you are, uh, uh, indeed, you do a class analysis, but your class analysis divide, dividing uh, the poor, the rich, and so on. My question is, if you have all groups which are important in these conflicts, you are analyzing. First, the first question would be, if you are not perhaps too early uh, saying that the rich is not participating in this conflict. And I think they are participating very mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. uh, in that terms that they are capturating the state and uh, promoting the formation of uh, majorities in the Congress through their power. So the rich is a crucial actor in the conflicts you are facing in Brazil today. And the second point is, if uh, this is the second second. Yeah, the second one, the last one. <laughs> I promise this is the very, very, very last one. Because um, you say uh, you have a conflict between the poor and intermediary sectors. My question is, uh, perhaps you have two kinds of intermediary sectors, and this is also convergent with the question of uh, Maria Mina and Angela. These intermediary questions, uh, sectors, they are divided in established middle class and newcomers, and I think the conflicts exactly between the newcomers and the established middle class. But uh -huh. these this, this are elements for the discussion. Uh -huh. It's not really uh -huh. uh, only a question. Thank you. Uh, let's give back to, to Matt, and then we'll yeah. have a, another series of questions, OK? Let me, let me try to, because actually, there are around seven questions <laughs> <laughs> here. Uh, well, uh, how can I? 
let, let uh, many questions uh, are around this position, this, this argument that there is a conflict between the poorer and the middle class, just to make things simple, simple right? Um, uh, I don't. I do not think this is the only uh, conflict. Uh, indeed, regarding taxes, for example, be the conflict between that the richer, the richer that do not pay taxes and those that pay taxes is increasing. So again. It's, but what I'm what I'm trying to, to, to call attention to is to uh, the point that given the structure of income inequality in Brazil, raising the earnings of the poorer and low is low skilled who sells services to those that are better than them, turns out to be an important conflict. And then it might explain, for example, those middle class that hate Lula. It's not a, a in my point is that this conflict does not only have a symbolic origin, source. It also has a material uh, source. Um, and uh, is something, this is a point I think that most of those that are thinking about the conflicts in Brazil uh, do not take into account. Mm. Uh, I understand that the center right wing already found an explanation for the social conflict in Brazil. Their argument was built along Governor Temer, and they say that the enemies are public officials. And so our flag is to fight the, the, um, the, the rights of public officials, and this will reduce inequality uh, in Brazil. Uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, uh, the, 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 the conditions um, public officials works are, I think, they are a source of inequality and I'm not favoring it. What I'm trying to say is that this is one explanation for the, the conflicts uh, in Brazil and it, 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 this explanation turns out to be a program. Left-wing parties, uh, frame the conflict as if it were a conflict between the poorest and the richest. Or in a more loosely way, those that are against Lula, which is not the same thing, but it's taken as if it were. Uh, and my, my point is only that a highly unequal society in which services are, pri are private, entails an important conflict, social and political conflicts when inequality reduction takes place because making the lives of the poor better implies reducing the real value of the budgets of those. Because that, 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 this, this, uh, this figure shows what each quantile earned. But it does not show their cost of life. And so if those in the bottle sell services to the, 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 the others, the, the, those that are a bit a bit better, they earn more, but they might spend more, and so their life's more difficult. That's the that's the point. So, and I think that um, the the 
the problem would not be symbolic, although I understand nothing about symbolism, so I'm, I'm risking here, but the symbolism would not be so important if it didn't have a material uh, uh, basis. Uh, and that's why I also think that it's not only a matter of uh, economic de development because the, 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 the disagreement of the discomfort of what we call loosely as the middle code was already there in 2013. So the question is, uh, if Brazil is so good, because why is people so angry at this country? I think that this has this kind of uh, zero-sum game, which is not between the richest and the poorest, but between the remaining 80 poorest or so. Um, that's the best I can do for, um, <laughs> for now. Um, I, uh, there, there are many, many, uh, to less, about the, 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 the groups in conflict. It's, it's very, very hard to, to, uh, to, to answer that. I, I think that there are many cleavages going on in, in Brazil now. Uh, th there are two questions. Uh, the power and equality, I, I didn't forget Vargas question, but I, 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 I I'll talk about power inequality uh, just to finish that at this point. Yeah. It's very hard to observe power inequality. It's very, very hard if possible. For example, we came to know by Lava Jato that two corporations bought the Brazilian state. And they, they were able to pay bills, to buy bills, to, how can I say, encomendar? To order bills. I, I understand this is power. And they, how many votes do they have? But you know that it happens in all democracies. And we, we know that in spite of, uh, of, uh, of poorer being the majority in most democracies, the fact is, as Otaviano has showed this morning, inequality has been increasing. And so there, for sure, there are other mechanisms going on. Uh, and so uh, we can say that, uh, that uh, in democracy, everyone has one vote, but, but some have power. But the problem is, how do you observe that? How we know that uh, in the power, of course, uh, corporations have powers, but some organized group ha groups have as well. So the problem is that we know that there is inequality in access to power, but how to study that? How to observe that? How could it's 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 a very very tough uh, question. So um, and about Vargas, in Vargas there has been a lot of inclusion, because before ba Vargas, uh, a president dared to say loudly that the, so the social question was a police question. So uh, question, uh, Vargas, for course, changed, but he changed for some. Only those considered uh, decent workings, workers which was observed to have in a formal uh, job market was considered a citizen. So Vargas produced inclusion, but a big divide as well. And in spite of all the industrialization we underwent, all economic growth, all miracle, blah, 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 60% were out in 1988. So, again, it's not black and white. It's <laughs> it has different dimensions. Okay. Some more questions? Yeah. Please, here. Yeah. Thanks. 
fantastic presentation. Matt, I want to make a comment on the real wage because you pinpointed the real wage as an important tool to explain a lot of what happened. It's true, one cannot deny that, but, uh, but Maria Hermine is also right. There was indeed uh, a non-positive sum gain, not only uh, in between the household, as the case that you were referring to, but at the economy at large. Uh, in the beginning, challenging what many economists expected, Lula's boldness to raise the minimum wage worked well. It installed a virtual uh, cycle in which higher demand for consumption of service coming from the poor middle class uh, led to uh, a rising tide of employment, which was made possible because of the rising prices of commodities. Now, after a certain point, this ceased to be true. Because having the real wage rising more and more than productivity, because that's one thing, Brazil productivity never changed. It was bad over this year. We, we lived through uh, a boom fed only by commodity price. When the commodity price fell down, all this was fake. So the manufacturing industry, there were three sectors. The commodities could survive with a rising wage because the prices were going up out there. Service, they could simply uh, lift up the markup. That's why Sao Paulo and Brazil, like Moscow, became one of the most expensive cities in the world because of the wage. Nonetheless, a third sector, manufacturing, didn't have how to do it. Result is, by 2010, the investment manufacturing industry was down, down and, and it never recovered. So rising real wages above productivity functioned, including as a redistributive uh, mechanism, only up to a point. After a certain point, it became deleterious. It's important to remark this, mm -hmm. that it's not the, during the whole trajectory there that the rising real wages was a good thing, not necessarily after a certain point, it was deleterious. Mm -hmm. It helped understand why we are so stuck in a crisis now. Mm -hmm. And most important than this, there's no way one can bring back this. Can, uh, the Lula supporters must understand that the figures that okay. you showed. So the Lula you say if you Lula were, ele were elected, it wouldn't be possible. Was it would be impossible, yeah. More questions? Please. Please. My name is Pedro. I'm from State University of Rio de Janeiro. And I'd like to thank, by the way, the organizers for the event and the presentation, which was quite enlightful and empirically well stated. So we it's like lunch at a big discussion over the interpretation of the situation just present. And the point relating inequality to democracy, it's like a tricky one. And I think somehow the concession of vote for poor people in general, I agree, as you said, that it changed the environment for political elites to make calculations and so on. But that I would like to raise a concern about reducing all political activity of the poor, of the subaltern, of whatever we shall call them, is to voting in elections. Because the change in political environments that resulted in the Constitution of 88 was transpassed by grassroots movements and social contestation that in somehow self-entitled rights that wasn't recognized institutionally. So it was a political force from below that uh, forced, that obliged some social counter to democratization and including bringing right-wing politicians to a compromise that some social policy was needed, otherwise democracy wouldn't be viable. And so I would like to pose the question if democracy in an equal society is the same thing that s democracy in uh, 
mobilized societies that are somehow pushing rights to the forefront in opposite to the situation where rights are being lost and we don't have like social density or social force to resist and we somehow democracy in itself it's not enough to deal with when you have political activity beyond voting and when it's somehow reduced to voting well that's it more questions we have still have some time for them if someone wants to make a question in Portuguese it's not forbidden <laughs> you can do it and we can translate to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> questions okay I'm not sure if I can answer uh, your question because if I correctly understood you were saying that Brazilian society was more mobilized in the, in the late 80s than it is today. I, I don't know. I really uh, don't know. Uh, all I can say, and that is, and it is uh, an ex ex speculation, is that I have the impression that consensus, or, or at least a shared common, that poverty and inequality are unacceptable, was stronger in that period than now. Um, but I, 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 I have no no information to 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 think seriously about uh, your question. Sorry, and I, okay. no, I, 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 he informed me about the. Yeah, but there is, I think that there is an important, uh, an important uh, uh, assumption behind uh, Otaviano's uh, statement, which is also behind uh, mine, is that we cannot analyze uh, a, a, a long period like that as if the, the kind of conflicts and challenges were the same all over the period. So there, there are endogenous changes in the, the kind of conflicts we face are different. That, that's why I'm a bit skeptical about this, you know, long-term uh, quantitative analysis that not take into account uh, deep change in situations. So the question, the question uh, you raised, for example, so if I took an average of social, of either e, e, uh, index of social mobilization for the entire period, or what does it mean? So if I, if I uh, try to understand support for uh, social policies in the entire period, uh, my impression is that it changed. <coughs> What is saying that is the, the, the impact of, an, of the minimum wage on the economy and on the political conflicts as well, it changed. So that's why I think that the analysis I'm trying to make, it may explain from the 85 to 2015, if it explains something, but something changed. And it, it seems that some important dimensions of the, of the conflict, the conflicts Brazil faces uh, uh, have changed. So it might be, and I believe that the, the variables are the same, or otherwise it would be impossible to make any theory, but their behavior and their combination um, changed. 
Yes. Oh, yeah, we have, uh, have some just, time. just a compliment. And also, one has to take into account that the 1988 Constitution uh, was a kind of an umbrella. So you had everything there, reflecting the aspiration after the process of democratization. This is important to keep in mind because uh, making material the constituency is what lies behind uh, the rise in government spending from 22% of GDP to 34%. And why is that? Because you had the, the newly acquired social rights, that's the good part, but it also had lots and lots of old privileges that were kept there maintained. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, the, the, the Brazilian constitution is not all progressive in that sense. And in fact, materializing it is arithmetically, algebraically impossible. Otherwise, it will lead to government spending beyond, beyond the GDP, more than 100%. So let's keep this in mind. To some extent, it was a politically noble movement, but keep this in mind. Uh, everything, you have a demand, put it there. Uh, so in that sense, that way is easy to mobilize, right? If you don't have to say no. <laughs> now is that the thing. <laughs> Okay. No? No. Well, there's a question there. Thank you. I'm Arthur from Getulio Vargas Foundation. We, we have observed a great inclusion in the last 30 years, but we remain a highly unequal country. So I would like to ask if you think that this change, this inclusion, is one more uh, it's related to the economic conju conjuncture or is an uh, structural change in the Brazilian society? Thank you. Actually, this is the subject of tomorrow morning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I think that I forgot to answer uh, Angela's question about other factors. Uh, in, fa in fact, uh, there has been an important uh, demographic change, there has been economic growth uh, so that uh, affect uh, uh, the, 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 the process we, we had in, in Brazil. But uh, of, of course for us, what is important is the, the, the role of policies. So that's because it's what we can uh, think about and maybe decide about. Um, so, I think that we changed a lot to remain an unequal society. What, what, we were much more in equality than we are today, but we are still very unequal. Uh, it's hard to say what is a structural change. Uh, what is a structural change? What, what do you mean by a structural change? That, uh, did Brazil uh, become an equal society? For sure not. It became just less unequal. Does it mean that uh, uh, changes are taken for granted? Not even Europe which is known as the least equal democracies in the world have changes uh, taken for granted because inequality and inequality increased a lot. Can we say that we became a middle class society as some Europeans once? For sure not. We are not, we are still a very unequal society. But the point is, uh, if, our, if our landmark, is some uh, is structural change, we cannot see any movement. Because we, what I try to show you is that we had an incremental, slow, and not for granted change, but it was important. It changed uh, people's life, and it created new conflicts that may even hinder the process we undertake, not because the elite 
is against it, but probably because the middle class can support it. So, I, so uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, if we, we take any kind of radical change to accept there has been a uh, change, uh, we cannot see important movements that although incremented, incremental, uh, although slow, they moved. That's my problem is with uh, Piketty's uh, criteria. Because for Piketty, if the 1% do not get less, there has been no change. That's why he, his conclusion is that change is only possible through war, not through democracy. Because his, his criteria is so far that only uh, Soviet Union in the war uh, can be accepted as change. And in spite of that, there has been a lot of change. So the, again, our conclusions highly depend on the concept and the method we, we, we use. This. So if we expect uh, an structural change, uh, in this case, there has been no change. But the point is, is this kind of change that we can expect in, in a democracy highly illegal as ours? Okay, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's have a pause for a coffee break, and then we'll, we will resume, and the participants will be you. Uh, we have reserved uh, three sessions uh, for uh, the people who came here to the school present their, their work, discuss their work, and this is a very important for us. And so I invite you, everybody to, to stay here, stay with us. I would like to uh, the uh, the participants of today have sent some, a summary of their presentation so the discussion can think about it before uh, hearing in the uh, in the table. I would uh, I would ask also for the other people who are presenting on Monday and Wednesday uh, to please send uh, an abstract uh, resume of their presentation so the the discussion can be more efficient. Okay. Mm -hmm.